Hi, I'm Matt. And I'm Thomas. And we're here to teach you about some sea creature natural histories that are interesting, intriguing, and just plain weird. So we'll start out where everyone starts out talking about weird animals, in the deep sea. The first creature we'd like to introduce to you is the blobfish, Cycrolutes marsidus. This organism has made its rounds to the media lately as being the ugliest organism ever. The flesh of the blobfish is actually gelatinous and slightly less dense than water. This aspect of the fish, along with its general lack of muscle, are what cause it to look so ugly when out of water. But it's quite great for expending uh, little energy along the seafloor. Matt, do you know of any other animals that control buoyancy in a similar way? Absolutely. My favorite cephalopod is the vampire squid. It may be called a squid, but it is neither a squid nor is it a vampire, but it will still haunt your dreams. It is in an order of its own, however it is actually more closely related to octopi. This creature also has gelatinous tissue that enable it to stay buoyant at great depths in the water column. This is one weird animal. It is bioluminescent, meaning it has photo photophores that produce light. Does your stupid blobfish do that, Thomas? No, it doesn't. It has nothing like that, but it also doesn't really need it for its feeding behavior. Because it floats just above the sea floor and doesn't really have any sort of muscles built for swimming, it just kind of eats whatever floats in front of it, or you know, whatever floats into its mouth. Maybe that's why they're all so sad when they're in their pictures. That vampire squid sounds pretty cool though. Uh, what? There has to be some other interesting facts about it. Yes, the vampire squid also has a rather passive way of feeding. It is the only cephalopod that uses a specialized retractable filament. The filament is essentially a mucus-covered string that the vampire squid releases to, like, to try to sinking in the water column, before reeling it in back to its mantle. Despite its threatening name and appearance, the vampire squid is actually really small, about a foot long, and does have predators. To stop from getting attacked, it can pull its webbed tentacles over its mantle in what is called pineapple posture, which alludes to the spike-like sea ray that extend from its bottom of its ten tentacles and can scare the predators from eating. Wow. These two animals are interesting, that's for sure. But most people know things from the deep sea are a bit weird. How about we bring this up in the water column a little bit? Alright, what do you have for me then? Well, you know you said that the vampire squid was the stuff of nightmares? I got a real nightmare for you. Cymothoa exigua, or the tongue-eating louse. This is another organism that people might have seen pictures of in the media. The BBC had a, a story about it in 2005, um, being in a snapper up in the UK. Uh, but generally, people don't actually know about its life. The louse is a parasitic crustacean, and a protandrous hermaphrodite, meaning it starts off as a male and becomes a female later in its life. The males live in the gills of their host fish, with the females uh, sucking blood from the fish's tongue until it decays and withers away. The female then takes the place of the tongue, feeding on what the fish eats, as well as blood and mucus from the host fish. Ew, parasites are gross. Speaking of parasites, one of my favorite fish, the ocean sunfish, or mola mola, is basically an apartment complex for parasites. This fish, the heaviest of all bony fish, can house up to 40 different species of parasites living on or in it at any given time. The poor things become so bothered by the parasites that they will try to get rid of them by breaching or by a mutualistic behavior in which they swim sideways by the surface of the water for birds to pick off the nasty critters living in the skin. Alright, that's pretty good, but I have one more thing about that louse that will really creep you out. So after the females atrophy the tongue and take its place, repro reproduction still has to happen. It's believed that the males sneak in from the gills of the fish and reproduce with the females as they're, as they're in the mouth of the fish, with the female still essentially acting like the tongue. And this kind of thing isn't just happening somewhere over in Australia, or somewhere far away. These can actually be found up into the Gulf of California and all the way down to Ecuador, so pretty close to home. That's gross, dude. I don't want anything mating with my tongue. Actually, I'd prefer nothing mate in my mouth. Please and thank you. Well, it may not be as weird as that, 
Mola mola reproduction is still very unique. Females can produce up to 300 million eggs in their ovaries, and this is necessary because fertilization happens outside of the body in the pelagic ocean, meaning relatively few eggs get, get fertilized. From there, the small planktonic larvae grow very fast up to a maximum size of 10 by 10 feet and thousands of pounds by eating lots and lots of jellyfish. All right, well, we're out of time, but thank you very much for joining us on finding out some information about these four really interesting and weird sea creatures. Goodbye.